Hello, and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. Earthquakes, disease, and a presidential assassination. The Caribbean nation of Haiti has had a torrid decade. This week, we look further back into what Haiti's history reveals about its political fragility and what that means for the country's ability to recover from disasters. Each time there's a disaster, it weakens some other part of the system. And we hear about new research chronicling the experiences of Japanese Americans interned by the U.S. government during World War II. They were required to write essays on democracy and liberty, which is the ultimate irony because they were prisoners of the U.S. government. I'm Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. A powerful 7.2 magnitude earthquake has struck Haiti. 104 people have been confirmed the dead. The death toll continues to rise in Haiti following the weekend's deadly Hospitals earthquake. Hospitals are running at full capacity and there is scarcity of food and supplies. As per UNICEF estimates, over 1 million people are affected by the earthquake, which killed over 2,000 people so far. The death toll from the huge 7.2 magnitude earthquake that struck the southwestern coast of Haiti on the 14th of August, now stands at more than 2,200 people. Around 130,000 homes have also been damaged or destroyed. This is on top of the fact that Haiti is still recovering from the devastating 2010 earthquake. That killed an estimated 220,000 people, injured another 300,000, and left much of the capital, Port-au-Prince, in ruins. This was followed by a deadly cholera epidemic introduced to the country by UN peacekeepers deployed after the quake. More than five years after the initial outbreak of cholera, people are still dying. Throughout this time, the UN has steadfastly refused to accept any responsibility for the outbreak. This year's August earthquake struck as Haiti reeled from the assassination of its president, Jovenel Moïse, in early July. Haitian officials say the team of assassins who killed the president in its home in the middle of the night went yesterday were well-trained professional commandos with large... The assassination is the latest twist in Haiti's long and turbulent political history. In this episode, we'll be looking back at how that history has been shaped by foreign interference and how Haitians have suffered as a result. But first, let's explore what's influenced Haiti's ability to respond to its most recent crises. My name is Louise Comfort. I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, University of Pittsburgh. Louise studies decision-making in disaster situations. She knows Haiti well and led a study of the response to the 2010 earthquake. I asked her what the situation is like now in Haiti. It's extremely difficult. The area that was struck is literally the southwestern part, and the roads there are very difficult, and it's been difficult for aid to get through. There is really only a regional airport at Lakai. It was difficult for planes and helicopters to come in. Trucks were trying to bring aid in from Port-au-Prince, which is a good 60 miles, you know, 100 kilometers away. And they were being ambushed by gangs that were literally stripping the trucks of aid. But finally, I would say now weeks after the earthquake, some aid has come in, but there are still people living in the rubble. Many of them did not have tarps. They had to deal with the tropical storms that came through, which made the situation even worse. A downpour of disastrous dimensions. Tropical storm Grace couldn't have hit at a worse time. Only days before, an earthquake had left tens of thousands homeless. Now they're scrambling for shelter with nowhere dry to spend the night. And usually there is a very ready response from Cuba, which is really close. And Cuba has excellent medical staff. But Cuba itself was going through trauma. And then add to this the additional trauma of COVID-19. So it was harder to get volunteers. And literally all of the hospitals in Lakai were destroyed and damaged. And there were no medical supplies in the first few days. They're coming in now. It's getting a little better, 
and the Haitian politicians have come through. But the most important organization in Haiti in providing aid literally is the Catholic Church, and uh, their networks have been providing support to the region. But it's been very difficult. And you say that the politicians have come through because uh, it's been a very difficult political situation. Gunmen raided Moise's home in the early hours of Wednesday. The government has declared an emergency. So this happened a month after the assassination of the president. So how has that played into the recovery? Well, unfortunately, it made it much more difficult. It has appointed a new prime minister in the wake of the President Moise's assassination. Ariel Henry pledged to improve the country's security situation. Ariel Henry is a neurosurgeon that literally had little experience in this area because he is a surgeon. He knew about hospitals and medical care and how important that is. And so he emphasized that. But there's a certain mechanism that needs to be put in place. The government needs to activate the United Nations request for assistance. And he needed really the support of the UNDP people. And so he has done that. But it took a bit longer than it would have had. And he hasn't had actually a lot of support in Haiti because of the rival parties. It's beginning to stabilize. And uh, I'm pleased to say that there are people in Haiti that are setting their party affiliations aside and really responding to the needs of the people in Lakai. You've written a piece for The Conversation in which you've used the term cascading crises to describe what's happened in Haiti over the past decade. Can you explain why you use that term? Well, if we start with the earthquake of 2010. The Caribbean island nation of Haiti has been rocked by its biggest earthquake in more than 200 years. The 7.0 quake hit just south of the capital, Port-au-Prince. Massive earthquake, major damage. Eleven ministries were damaged, not functioning. The major hospital of the city was totally destroyed. The way in which the aid flooded into the country and was managed was not particularly useful to Haiti. Most of the organizations came in and they were from the 100 countries, but they were operating in English. The national language of Haiti is French. And at this point, there were international organizations and people meeting with one another out of the airport and making decisions about Haiti in English and relatively few Haitians were actually involved in that situation. And so they were trying to do the right thing, but they weren't connecting with the actual Haitian organizations. The Haitians themselves realized it would take probably 20 years to rebuild both the infrastructure and the economy and the electrical power and the educational institutions that they needed. After that event, both Haitians and people in the international community were trying to design a 20-year plan forward. But since Haiti was already weak, the political structures were not strong. There was a lot of conflict. Haiti is very close to Colombia. (laughs) And unfortunately, the drug cartels see Haiti as a through point to pass their drugs to the U.S. and Europe. In a country as poor as Haiti, if you offer people, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, it's very hard to turn it away. And consequently, although the Haitian police was very much involved, I can't say definitively, but it was clear that not only were drugs going through, but they were fueling the gangs that were creating difficulty and disrupting the distribution of aid in the country. And then the drug traffic creates other problems that siphons money away from the government to rebuild roads, infrastructure, hospitals, to invest in education and, um, you know, clean water uh, distribution systems for its people. So the whole 
economic and social development of the country is set back by these problems. Then comes the hurricanes, <laughs> and Haiti was struck by hurricanes in 2016 and 2018. Tonight, the most powerful hurricane to hit Haiti in more than 50 years is causing chaos and panic with winds of 145 miles per hour. Hurricane Matthew is one of the most dangerous to hit the Caribbean in decades. With Category 4 strength, winds and rain. And then another earthquake on top of that. So you have a weak governance structure in the beginning that needs support from the outside. But when it's not able to cope with the series of disasters, each time there's a disaster, it weakens some other part of the system. And the different components of the system are all related and need to operate together for Haiti to function as a, an economic you know, viable, sustainable society. Earthquakes, hurricanes, drug cartels, a cholera epidemic, that really is a cascade of crises that honestly any society would struggle to handle. Yeah, not to mention the assassination of a president just before a major earthquake strikes. To unpack the history of Haiti, I called up Jean-Eddy Saint-Paul, Jean Eddy is a Haitian American and a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College at the City University of New York. He's also the former founding director of the Haitian Studies Institute there. I asked him to take us back to 1804, the year that Haiti became independent from French colonial rule. It was the time of the Industrial Revolution. It was a time also of many important revolutions, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, but also the Haitian Revolution happened in that period. The only revolution that actually challenged slavery, challenged racism, challenged white supremacy, and challenged segregation was the Haitian Revolution. 1804 is the consequences of more than 200 years of enslavement of people of African descent. So what happened? Haitian people, they fought between 1790 until 1803, 13 years to get their independence. The Haitian revolution couldn't be possible we found something that happened in the north of Haiti called Vertier. In November 18, 1803, the local army of the Haitian people, of those slaves, the vast majority of the soldiers, they were born in Africa. They challenged and they defeated the most powerful army at that moment, it was the French army during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte that would challenge the geopolitics of the world. The revolution in Haiti foiled Napoleon's plan to create a French empire in the Americas. He'd intended to transport commodities such as sugar and coffee from Haiti to Louisiana, where he could sell them on to other countries. But with Haiti now liberated, Napoleon decided to scrap this plan and sell Louisiana. Before that, Louisiana belonged to France. But 20 days after the defeat at Vertier, Napoleon Bonaparte would make a deal with Thomas Jefferson and Napoleon Bonaparte would sell Louisiana to the U.S. And uh, with the acquisition of Louisiana, the Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. would become a continental power. And the U.S. also would aspire to become an empire. So 1804, the country becomes independent. What happened in the immediate aftermath of independence? The most powerful nation, they didn't recognize the independence of Haiti. So they tried to put Haiti in isolation because they interpreted the Haitian Revolution as a challenge for them. All those powerful nations, they still had slave colony throughout America. Haiti was created as a very important military nation, but Haiti will transition to an empire, to a black republic. It was on October 8, 1804, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, the leader of the Haitian Revolution, was sworn as the emperor of Haiti. Jean-Jacques Dessalines got assassinated 
October 1806 and we will see a process of disintegration of the project of nation state in Haiti. France had a particular reaction to Haitian independence a couple of decades later. The president Jean-Pierre Boyer, he was the president of, of Haiti. He accepted to pay to France 150,000 francs for property loss and slave. It's like currently the equivalent of between 21 and 38 billion dollars. Yeah. It was just ridiculous because I beat you and then you came back 21 years after to ask me, pay me back because I lost my slave. That would start the process of international debt and it need that cash flow in order to develop. We, Haitian people, we pay that money between 1825 until 19. 47 and the international community they sidelined with friends they didn't say that was not normal to do to a small nation to an independent country so you've got this french imperial debt that's laden on a country that's just struggling with its founding father being assassinated now obviously lots has happened in the 200 years of, of haitian history but can you talk us through some of the key points around the u.s involvement in the country and and how that's manifested itself. I mentioned earlier that it's because of Haiti that the U.S. would become a continental power. And the guy who actually helped Thomas Jefferson to have that deal with uh, friends was uh, James Monroe. But James Monroe would eventually become president of the U.S. And Monroe would launch what we call the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine stipulated that America is for American. The Monroe Doctrine stipulated that any intervention across the Americas by foreign powers was a hostile act against the United States. It was this that the US used to justify its interventions in the region, including in Haiti. By the end of the 19th century, the US wanted now to create their empire. So they actually invade Haiti and occupy Haiti for 28 years, between 1915 and 1934. And during that invasion, they changed the Haitian constitution because they wanted now to own land in Haiti. In the previous constitution, no foreigner could own land in Haiti. And when you start owning land in Haiti, you start undermining the sovereignty of the country. But the U.S. will continue the same logic of friends. You have to undermine Haiti economically because what they did also, they used the money from the National Bank of Haiti. They took that money and that money was never restituted to Haiti. The U.S. also would destroy the National Army of Haiti and they would they create a gendarmerie, an army that was more willing to defend U.S. interests. By 1934, the U.S. left Haiti, but they put in place institutions, the military, in order to uh, continue to preserve U.S. interests. And the army created and left by the U.S. would be very instrumental in undermining political leadership in Haiti. For instance, between 1946 and 1950, Haiti had a very progressive leader, President Dumas Estime. But in 1950, Paul-Egène Magloire, who was, you know, trained by the U.S. Army, he will overthrow Estime. A backdrop to all this was the Cold War. The U.S. was engaged with the Soviet Union in the Cold War, and the idea was to fight between democracy and communism. And Haiti is located very close to Cuba. And in January 1st, 1959, it was the Cuban Revolution. And the Cuban Revolution was a socialist revolution. And the U.S. managing the idea to content communism in the Caribbean, the U.S. will sideline with one of the most retrograde politicians, François Duvalier. The U.S. would give to the dictatorship of the Duvalier military economic assistance 
in order to build a dictatorship in Haiti. It was a dictatorship that killed more than 60,000 people. And the U.S. has a huge moral responsibility in that thing. But We're going to fast forward a little bit here. François Duvalier, also known by his nickname Papa Doc, died in 1971. But his brutal regime continued under his son, Jean-Claude, also known as Baby Doc. His regime lasted until 1986, when he was overthrown in a popular uprising. A transition to democracy followed, and in 1990, a Catholic priest, Jean Aristide, was elected president. But Aristide was a guy who was anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism. The U.S. did not like him. They used the CIA and the hierarchy of the army. And on September 29, 1991, they overthrew Aristide. After another period of military rule, a fragile democracy returned to Haiti. Aristide came back from exile and was re-elected in the year 2000. But he was overthrown again in another coup in 2004, engineered, according to Jean Adi, by Washington in Paris. Why is because Aristide refused to implement neoliberal policies so you can see throughout the second part of the 20th century, you have the same political meddling of the U.S. through the foreign policy to undermine institution and politics in Haiti. This meddling has continued into the 21st century, jean says, with the U.S. often supporting the least credible candidates in elections. So that happened, for instance, in 2010 and 2011, when we had election, they picked Michel Martelly, who was just a musician, a singer, over a PhD, a university professor, Milan Maniga, an expert in constitutional law. A famous singer in Haiti. Now, he's taking the oath of office to become the leader of Haiti. Diplomats from throughout the world have come to Port-au-Prince to celebrate the inauguration of the new president, Michel Martelly. You can see these are ambassadors from out the world representing the United States of America, Bill Clinton, the former president. The following year, a few months after Hurricane Matthew tore through Haiti, his successor, Juvenal Moïse, was elected. He was really unknown for the vast majority of the Haitian population. He was not a charismatic figure before he became president. The Haitian population never saw Juvenal Moïse as someone to serve the community. They always identify Jovenel with the oligarchy. Haiti actually is a country that economically is running by an oligarchy. That oligarchy is made by between some experts say 20 family, other experts say 26 family, other experts say 29 family. But one thing is when Jovenel became president, Many contracts that he had to put his signature on to benefit the oligarchy, he saw that it was too much to do to the country. So he picked two of them to hold them accountable. He didn't do nothing for the other member of the oligarchic family. And he got assassinated. This is one of the most important hypotheses because of his action to hold accountable only two prominent members of the oligarchy, because he didn't understand the political cartography in Haiti. Mm. And he'd had a series of protests against him in, in 2019 as well, hadn't he? Yeah, we had a movement called Petro Challenger, because... Venezuela helped Haiti with a deal that is called Petro Caribe. And Haiti would use that money to build school, hospital, you know, some very important project for the development of Haiti. But that money was misused. And the administrative court of Haiti did an audit about the Petro Caribe. And they found that Jovenel Moïse, his enterprise in the northwest of Haiti, was mentioned 69 times. In the report, so between 2018 and 2020, Jovenel Moïse faced a lot of popular protests. He was a guy that has a very lack of legitimacy in Haiti. He was very unpopular in Haiti. 
The circumstances surrounding Jovenel Moïse's assassination and who ordered it remain murky. At least 44 people have so far been arrested, including a group of Colombian mercenaries, and investigations are ongoing. In the meantime, Moïse's successor, Ariel Henry, has promised to hold elections, currently scheduled for November the 7th. The history that you've just explained... What lessons can it give us and, and what can we learn from it for the future? Because now there will be elections uh, probably before the end of the year. The U.S., the international community, have been always uh, negative external forces that have shaped the political leadership in Haiti. But Gemma also, I'm very scary about the future of Haiti. Any country cannot be built without elites. And unfortunately in Haiti, the political class is mostly made by mafia. They don't have any project to build a strong democracy, a strong political regime. You need political party, you need party that are ideologically positioned in the right, in the left, in the center. But in Haiti, you don't have that because people have a party, but the party is like a, their own business. In order to receive grant from the USAID, to receive grant from NDI, to receive grant from the uh, Republican Institute. But we don't have political elite with a sense of commitment. So I would like also the audience to not think that I am uh, trying to just make the international community responsible for everything that is, has been happening in Haiti. It's because also in terms of political culture, the local elite, they are absolutely co-opted. And you, when you have a country with local actors so weak, of course, any country, the U.S. has interest. So they will send NGO, they will send people to dictate you what to do. They have to change their culture. Thank you so much, Joindy. It's been such an interesting and uh, thorough look at the history and uh, we appreciate you talking to us. So thank you. My pleasure, Gemma. You can read articles that Louise Comfort and Joindy St. Paul wrote about the situation in Haiti on The Conversation. We'll put some links in the show notes to those as well as to some other articles on the evolving situation after the earthquake. Our second story this week is about a dark moment in U.S. history that took place in my home state of California, the internment of around 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry during World War II. They came from California, Oregon, Washington, and parts of Arizona, and two-thirds of those interned were American citizens. This December marks 80 years since the Japanese bombing of the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, the catalyst for the detention of Japanese Americans for the duration of the war. I've been talking to a historian about a new book she's just published on the experiences of those who lived in the prison camps. I'm Susan Kamei. I'm a lecturer in the Department of History in the University of Southern California Dornside College of Letters, Arts and Sciences. I have a day job also in Dornside College as the Managing Director of the Spatial Sciences Institute. My grandparents and parents and their families were among those who were incarcerated by the U.S. government during the war. Most of us, though, who are the third generation, we didn't hear anything really about our family's experiences uh, for lots of emotional reasons. And so it really wasn't until I was a law student and then as a young professional working on the campaign to address this as a government wrong. Uh, this campaign was called the Redress Movement, that I really learned about not only what happened to my family and their situations, but uh, more about what the causes were and what many of the feelings and reactions were. Okay, so before we get into to the research that you're just about to publish, can you walk us through a brief history of what happened and what it was like to be one of those Japanese Americans who was interned in the US? Sure. The, the story tends to start in whatever encyclopedia entry that it was a military necessity because Pearl Harbor was bombed and there was reason to fear Japanese Americans as being loyal to Japan as opposed to loyal to the United States. This is a false narrative. 
the story really begins with decades of anti-Asian discriminatory policies that started with the Chinese that the Japanese immigrants walked into and other fears of Japan as a military power from the World War I days before the war as Japanese Americans became here on the West Coast uh, very uh, successful in agriculture that they were perceived as a economic threat, which was also false because these were small family farms, very labor intensive crops, such as vegetables and strawberries. They weren't actually competition for the big agribusiness, but the agribusiness seized on this as an opportunity to remove competition. The same with the fishing industry. So the Japanese Americans fishing communities in the port cities. So it was a context for being able to remove people that they considered undesirable for, for a number of reasons. And from the time that Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th, 1941, to the time that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued an executive order, Executive Order 9066 on February 19, it was only those short weeks that was the a nationwide political will that, yes, we have to round these people up and and get them off the West Coast. Japanese Americans living in Washington, Oregon, California, and a little bit of, of Arizona had to sell their belongings, sell their businesses. They were fired from jobs, were told on very short notice under armed guard soldiers with guns and bayonets to report to areas that were called control points and then were transported by bus or by train to places that they did not know where they were going. And they were not allowed to have a hearing or have charges brought against them. Out of the 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry who fell under the, under the jurisdiction of the War Relocation Authority, Two-thirds of them were American-born citizens, which includes my parents. Uh, That second generation were born in the U.S. to immigrant parents. So they were American citizens by birthright. And so much of the story gets reduced to sound bites and uh, generalizations are, are made. And I think what I've come away with a very deep appreciation for is that if there were we use the number 120,000 that experience incarceration. There are 120,000 different stories. Were the experiences different for different generations of people in the camps? So the first generation that came from Japan to the United States are called the Issei. It's got the Japanese word for one and say is the word for generation. The Children that were born here in the United States are the Nisei, me being the word for two. And then I'm part of the Sansei generation, San meaning three, and we're the children of the Nisei, the grandchildren of the Issei. So the first generation Issei, for the most part, only spoke Japanese. Their English, if they spoke English, was uh, tended to be limited. And if the Nisei are alive today, some of them are still hanging in there in their 90s and even into their hundreds. But at this point, they're they're unfortunately mostly all all gone. So the bulk of the material that went into the book is really drawn from videos of oral histories, interviews that captured the Nisei stories 30, 40 years ago. There was a effort that was done in uh, Orange County in the 1980s to interview some of these then living Issei pioneers, which included my grandmother, in Japanese and to have her oral history translated into English. But unfortunately, we don't have very many examples of those. What we have, for the most part, are the English-speaking American-born Nisei stories, who were children or teenagers or young adults during the war. And so the voices in the book are about the young people who experienced the war speaking over time now to young people today. So for instance, my parents were exactly of the age of being freshmen in high school when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And were you able to access any records of your parents' experience in the camps? Yeah, 
I, I also went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. They maintain the War Road Location Authority folders on each of the incarcerates. And so I spent a couple days there to go through the files that were kept on my parents, their parents, my father's siblings, and a few of my aunt's husbands. And that was just one of the most remarkable experiences of my life because there were sociological assessments by high school teachers. They were required to write essays on uh, to promote the sense of being an American and what their opinions were about democracy and liberty, which is the ultimate irony because they were right, expected to write this as prisoners of the U.S. government. And the government kept these student papers. And uh, one of my uncles was seven years old, and it's his childhood handwriting on pencil on that big kindergarten paper with the blue <laughs> with the blue lines. And and uh, their, their medical records were in there, their correspondence, if they had requested a leave to go take my aunt to a doctor out, outside of the camp. It's just amazing amount of detail that was in there. And their telegrams that went back and forth about their various approvals and, and the long delay. It was just some of this just just made me so angry, <laughs> even though I've lived with this. And you get to the point of thinking, how could I possibly be surprised by anything at this point? But I was just uh, you know overwhelmed and, and also very touched to see these records in all the forms my grandparents had to fill out. Wow. Um, are there any stories that, that kind of stand out for you about what this period of incarceration meant to a person and the long-term impact it had on them? So, for instance, one biography that's included in the book is by Mabel Ota, and it was the stories that she shared in her testimony. It was about the detail of her giving birth in the posting Arizona camp. And because of the inadequate medical care. When she was in labor, her baby suffered irreparable brain damage in the course of the delivery and has lived with that impairment for the rest of her life. And uh, whether it was medical tragedies or stories of family separation, the Issei fathers, in many cases who were community leaders, had been taken away by the FBI at the beginning of the war. The families did not know what had happened to them. And it, in many cases, uh, it was years before they were reunited. Uh, one story that's in the book about how the Issei father died in the jurisdiction of, of the Justice Department. They never knew what happened to him. And so one of the testimonies was talking about how last time he saw his father was before he got taken away by the FBI and he never saw him again. It's very traumatic and painful memories to bring up 40 years later and for you to be reading and listening to, I can imagine. What do you think the legacy of this period and, and what happened to Japanese Americans has been for the country? And as you put the book together in this moment that we're living in kind of 80 years later. There's so much that I think we learn and should take as relevant. When we experience fear as a nation, the human reaction is to try to identify some kind of enemy and make that the cause and want to protect ourselves. We want to do whatever we think is going to help make us deal with that fear and help us feel safer. And I think the lesson here, which is a lesson that's relevant today, is that as a community, as, as a nation, we must be careful that as we think about how we respond to that kind of fear, whatever that fear is, it could be it could be the COVID virus, right? And how there's been this rise of anti-Asian violence, expressions of hatred, because it's the virus has been identified as Kung flu or Chinese, that we're careful not to impinge on the rights and the liberties of, of others, that we also have strength in being allies for one another. In 1941, 1942, the Japanese Americans didn't have any effective allies and lacked the political clout to be able to have a voice 
to change the narrative, to, to push against what was this overwhelming discrimination and prejudice. And that as whether it was Muslim and those of Middle Eastern descent after 9-11, when the Japanese American incarceration is offered up as a precedence, as a justification for dealing with, with others that are considered undesirable. I think we live in this moment of responsibility of being vigilant and being aware that here are some of the very real downflow consequences that can happen when history repeats itself. Okay. Well, thank you for doing the work to put that all together and um, for sharing it with the world. So thank you for coming on to talk to us about it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Susan Kamei there. Her book is called When Can We Go Back to America? Voices of Japanese American Incarceration During World War II. You can read a couple of articles on the conversation that she's written during from her research. Ten this week's episode, we've got some recommended reading from Kalpana Jane in Boston on coverage of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Hello, this is Kalpana Jane, Conversations, Ethics and Religion Editor based in Cambridge, United States. The first recommendation I have for you this week comes from a series we are running on Muslims in America, tied to the 20th anniversary of 9-11 this week. The story describes why many Muslim women may feel empowered wearing the hijab or the headdress. Growing up in India, I hardly ever saw my Muslim friends or neighbors wearing the hijab. But I found in the US that many women I knew were making a choice to wear the headdress. So I reached out to scholars to write about it. Caitlin Killian, for example, a scholar at Drew University, explains how the hijab is a mark of identity, especially in the face of Islamophobia. She also writes how these issues go back to colonial rule, when Muslim women were encouraged to be more like European women and remove the veil. As demands for independence grew, the veil became a symbol of national identity and opposition to the West. My second recommendation is a very poignant piece also tied to 9-11 anniversary by Joel Christensen, professor of classical studies at Brandeis University. He writes that when he looks back on America's past 20 years, it's with two sets of eyes. Part of him feels the visceral sorrow and remorse, but as a scholar of Greek literature, he also sees how this collective trauma shaped US actions referring to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Hope you enjoy reading these stories as much as I did. Thank you. Kalpana Jaina. That's it for this week. Thanks to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode and to the conversation editors, Jeff Inglis, Naomi Shalit, Emily Costello, Stephen Kahn and to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com or email us podcast at theconversation.com. You can also, of course, sign up for our free daily email. There's a link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please leave us a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to. And tell your friends and family about the show too. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. I'm Dan Marino. Thanks so much for listening this week.